Good afternoon, everybody. It's that time of the afternoon where I don't know whether I should threaten to make noise to keep you awake or ask you to make noise to keep me awake. Uh, this work was done uh, jointly with an architect at, a, at an architectural firm where we looked an at an example of a uh, building that they were actually uh, having designed to be built and recognized that it had a thermal bridge in it and uh, looked at, well, what could we do about it? So uh, what and why would we be doing this? Uh, buildings represent a significant portion of uh, energy use, certainly in the U.S. and in first and second world countries and where there are climate issues, I'm sure in third world countries as well. Uh, thermal bridges are short circuits between conditioned space and the environment. A short circuit would be a, a connection between the uh, conditioned space and the outside uh, created by a high conductivity path. So a piece of steel going through the wall would be a uh, thermal bridge. Uh, it's, as I said, created by the use of uh, conductive materials. And if you can avoid it, you improve the energy consumption of the building as well as the conditions of the building. The building becomes more comfortable as well as less expensive to operate. How did this end up at ThermoSense? Uh, thermal bridges represent a localized heat loss. I'm talking in, in, cool, in the cool season, heating season. Uh, they therefore create a local thermal anomaly and under appropriate conditions, infrared can therefore detect them. And I suspect that many of you, as I, have been in the field and observed exactly those. Here are some examples. This is the interior surface of a wall in a, an apartment. Uh, we don't often think of it, but all of those studs and the cross piece are thermal bridges, and this is this was well built. It's well insulated. You know, it, it's a normal construction. It, it's not a construction issue. There's not a fault here. However, you have a design that has conductive wood, comparatively, next to non-conductive insulation, and therefore the wood is acting as a thermal bridge, creating a heat loss. On the inside, it looks cold. The scale on this infrared image is 57 to 64. Uh, there are alternative designs that address this already, such as using rigid board insulation completely covering the outside wall instead of depending only on insulation in the pocket. That then creates a solid insulation barrier that does not uh, lose heat uh, through the studs as much as a design like this would. This is an exterior wall. Uh, there's a concrete slab floor here, there's a concrete slab floor here, and concrete uh, is fairly conductive. And when it's connected directly to your outside wall, it's going to represent a heat loss. And if you look at uh, infrareds in cold weather of the outside of buildings with almost any kind of wall con uh, floor construction, you will see this, and that represents a thermal bridge and a heat loss. Uh, you can see, maybe not too clearly, but all the studs are thermal bridges. You've got a loss here that's more likely uh, the sleeve of the air conditioner is leaking air, and air is not in the same class. It's a problem, but it's not a thermal bridge, and it's not something that I'm addressing here. Uh, other common bridges would be concrete balconies that are contiguous with the floor slab. So you look at an apartment building, and it's got balconies every floor all the way around the building, every one of those is releasing heat because the floor inside is warm and it's connected to the balcony outside directly and it's fairly conductive and the balcony is therefore warmer than it should be if it were if it could be isolated with a thermal break. Thermally unbroken metal window frames are the ones people think of immediately when you say thermal bridge. Metal window frames without thermal brakes are a disaster from the energy standpoint in the building. Brick ties, tying the, uh, a brick veneer back to the building so it doesn't fall off. Brick relieving angles, which are essentially angle iron every one to two floors of, of height of the building holding the bricks up so you don't get excessive sag, are then tied back into the structural wall behind it and represent a bridge through that metal path. 
This is the, the, the design that was studied. Uh, it's a portion of the building. The building has been sliced here, sliced there, there, and along that line. What we have here is a visor. This is the roof, parapet wall, a visor, brick veneer, rigid insulation. The thermal envelope of this building is the dark gray. As you see where it's cut here, it is continuous. However, there's a support for the visor, and if we remove the plywood, essentially just make it invisible, you can see the thermal bridge. This is tubular steel, three inch square, with air inside that is welded to the structural steel inside. It re represents a direct thermal bridge of this building. An alternate design for that, uh, and the one which we studied, is to make the visor thicker and bring an insulation wrap around the inside of the, of the plywood visor so it's now continuous around the outside of all that extra steel, the outrigger and the cross member. Uh, this is not necessarily the ideal design. It's the design we studied. There are other ways that this could be accomplished. For example, uh, rather than put the insulation around the inside of the visor, you could insulate directly onto the 3x3 three three steel, potentially. You could substitute fiberglass reinforced plastic for the steel. It's a design possibility. Uh, we selected the one that we did because it is fairly simple. Uh, it would not require uh, detailed structural engineering to validate it. You know, it's, it's a, not really going to have a structural impact worth worrying about. You'd need to double check it, but it's not of the order of replacing steel with fiberglass reinforced plastic members that are supporting a visor. And I, I say fiberglass because it's less conductive than the steel. That would be the, reason, the way of eliminating that bridge. Uh, another view of the, of the two designs, you can see that the, the roof details, everything over there and over here is the same, the steel beam is the same, the only real difference is the visor plywood here is bigger, you've got insulation here and you've now uh, changed a little bit of the size or exposure of the front of the parapet and the top of the brick veneer on the wall. Right. I've said most of this, uh, the alternate design wraps the outrigger assembly with insulation. Uh, it's immediately inside the plywood visor cover. Minimal structural engineering changes and therefore minimal engineering uh, review would be needed. Uh, it's not necessarily an optimum, but it is a step in the right direction, certainly. And the changes that occur in this design are to the plywood and the adjacent surfaces. How did we study it? Uh, the uh, 3D uh, piece of the building that I showed you uh, was modeled as a three-dimensional uh, modeling exercise uh, doing heat transfer analysis using finite element analysis. Uh, the advantage of using three-dimensional analysis is that we can account for the fact that not only do we have a straight piece of steel coming out, but we have steel that extends that surface in the third dimension. If we did a two-dimensional analysis, we would most likely cut it vertically through the outrigger, the part that's coming out of the building, and lose the impact of that cross piece. Radiation and convection were allowed for and considered on the outside of the building. Uh, fluid dynamics was not considered, so we are not dealing with uh, eddy currents in the corner under the visor. We are not dealing with flow of air inside the, the, tu the tubular outriggers. We are not dealing with flow of air inside the structure itself where there are contained air spaces. And we're not dealing with airflow inside the building. Radiation inside the building was not uh, included in the analysis, but radiation in the, in, inside the building is far less significant than on the outside because the temperatures of the surfaces are much closer to the interior temperatures than those of the outside of the building to the radiation sinks for the outside, the, the ground at a distance and the sky at a distance. 
A cold case was developed uh, comparable to what would be design conditions. In other words, we need to design the building to withstand this cold condition. An average case was also evaluated, and that was based on heating degree days for the climate zone uh, over the heating season, and uh, therefore a, an average outdoor temperature was derived at about 38 Fahrenheit uh, as opposed to 10 Fahrenheit for the cold case, uh, and that was also studied. This was done uh, essentially corresponding to nighttime conditions, so the sun was not an issue in any of this. Uh, and steady state was used. We did not do transient analysis. Transient analysis is a possibility, but was not warranted in terms of what we were doing. The published paper has a lot more details that I'm going to make you sit through or try to avoid Timos shutting me down in 20 minutes. All right, two steps in the analysis really. One was develop graphics that look a lot like our images. They show you the temperatures or they show you the heat fluxes. Uh, and then mathematically, numerically, derive values for heat loss just from the visor and compare them across the two design cases, and also for the visor with the, its adjacent areas, because those are affected by the changes in the visor. So these are the not quite infrared images. These come out of the uh, finite elements software. Uh, program, the temperature ranges, uh, and other information you'll see down at the bottom here. This is a 4 to 70 Fahrenheit, and I took pity on the rest of the world, and here's the Celsius numbers. The paper didn't, wasn't quite so kind. Uh, these are four, view, four angle views uh, at 4 to 70, 4 being essentially the coldest temperature encountered, and 70 being the internal temperature, the, the room temperature. Uh, the things to, uh, I want to draw your attention to, one, Inside the building, you can see the impact of the, vi of the outrigger on the interior, making it cold there. You can just about see this slight warm stripe under the visor, and we'll, we'll take a better look at that. Uh, but other than that, you know, in this temperature scale, things look fairly uniform. If we look at a tighter temperature scale, this is now 4 to 10 Fahrenheit. So it's the coldest observed temperature up to the outside air temperature. So this is now looking at the outside conditions. Uh, you can very clearly see you've got a heat loss on the bottom of the visor. You've got a heat loss uh, because of the cross member supporting the visor. Uh, you have that as well on the top of the visor. You have it on the front of the visor. You don't really see anything at the end of the uh, outrigger's cross member. Uh, this, by the way, is a four-foot section, and the repeat length on the uh, outriggers is four foot. So there's one of these every four feet. So this is a, a representative section based on the, on the design of the outrigger. Um. Hmm? Really? Okay. One of the advantages of doing this in software is that you can peel pieces away and look at the things of interest. We couldn't do this in the infrared. So these are temperature plots for the existing outrigger, and you can see that it starts hot and loses temperature, gets very, co you know, gets cold. It's l and, and it's doing that because it's losing heat to the outdoors. Uh, this is the proposed system. The differences here, and this is again 4 to 70, there's a much fainter uh, signature there. The end of the, out of the uh, steel here is now warm by comparison because it's maintained its temperature. And if we look at the narrower, this is a much lighter signature. There is virtually no signature here, no signature there, although there is a signature in that inside corner. And that's a real signature. Uh, if we were out in the field seeing that in infrared, we'd say, oh, it's because it's a sheltered corner. This is not because it's a sheltered corner. This is an actual loss because sheltered corner would be CFD, and there's none of that in this, in this model. This is the proposed result, and you can see this is all hot in comparison to the previous one at uh, zero to 20, uh, 4 to 20, and you can see that this, it starts hot, cools off, but not nearly as far. So we are maintaining the temperature. It's staying warm, we are not, and that mean, that's a good thing because it means we're not losing heat. And this is a comparison of the existing and proposed, and you can see, you know, I, I don't think I need to explain it too much. I hope I don't because I'm running out of time. These are flux results, 
uh, BTUs per second per inch squared or watts per meter squared. Uh, and you can see there's a significant loss there, there, not so much in the existing. And I'm sorry, in the proposed. You can see the, the differences between the existing on the top and the proposed on the bottom. The design changes resulted in a considerable reduction in uh, flux from the surfaces. This is the same thing with a tighter uh, span, and it, it lets you see a little more clearly what's going on. There is a loss on this edge, even though even the proposed. Part of it is a uh, difference in boundary conditions between the front and the bottom. The bottom sees the ground as a radiation target. The front sees the sky as a radiation target, and those are two significantly different target temperatures. The impact on the heat loss uh, for the existing, for the three visor surfaces, top, front, and bottom, uh, drops from 5.54 to 4.23. If we include the front of the parapet, the number goes up, but still a significant drop. Uh, for the proposed, we, it drops uh, for all surfaces of the entire, the entire model, drops by uh, two versus 1.3 or 1.8 for the uh, various surfaces. You don't see as big a, uh, as big a loss in the seasonal because the conditions are milder. I've labeled this slide my observations because I haven't given you this, I haven't shown you the stuff behind it. Some of, a lot of it is in the paper, however. You can get good, one, you need good information about the environmental conditions. The better that information, the better your results are going to be. Radiation from the exterior plays a significant role. I did do a sensitivity analysis for both radiation and for the importance of uh, convection, which was not included explicitly, although convection coefficients on the surfaces were included. And that showed that these things are important, and they are important as well in the air that's contained, for example, uh, inside the visor. Uh, simulation resu results can give tools can give you unexpected results and help you explore why. The surfaces adjacent to the visor lost more heat in the proposed case than in the existing. The reason I believe, and I've only partially proven that to myself, is that you now have a hotter piece of metal inside because you've kept it warm, so you've raised a local temperature in the building near the adjacent surfaces, and therefore they're now losing more heat, at least at, you know, in some, some, some portions. These are conclusions. I showed you most of this. Uh, thermal bridging uh, in buildings can generate significant thermal anomalies. You saw those in, in the graphics, as well as in the uh, infrared images that I showed you. Uh, they can be detected in the field of infrared cameras under appropriate conditions, not always, but certainly sometimes. And uh, infrared images, especially if they're radiometric, can help you prioritize uh, the thermal bridges. And I want to emphasize that because temperature alone is not a guide, a full guide, to the loss represented by a location. It will change with the boundary condition. So looking at a higher temperature on the bottom of the visor versus the front of the visor doesn't necessarily mean you're losing more heat there it would be warmer because it's radiating to a warmer ground than the front is radiating to a cold sky. So temperature alone is, is not be all and end all. Uh, analysis uh, is important and lets you uh, see what's going on and find an element in analysis software as a way to do that. You can do multiple case studies in far less time than you can do field work or build models, physical models. Uh, 3D analysis will add information in many cases that is necessary for accurate understanding of what's going on. 2D analysis certainly helpful and sometimes is adequate. It is also the, the default of what is usually used in the industry. And uh, again, uh, temperatures alone are not adequate. Uh, simulation tools will allow in-depth and under-surface examination. You can take the simulated model apart and see what's going on inside. Uh, you can look at other temperature issues such as where is the dew point inside the structure of the building as you make changes. And transient analysis, which was not touched here at all, will give you additional information about how the building behaves or how whatever it else you need to study behaves. Significant amounts of energy will be saved by addressing thermal bridges in buildings. Three seconds.